Good morning. Welcome to Daily Devotion. I'm Pastor Krieger. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Today I want to revisit a passage uh, that we looked at last week from 1 Peter. Um, because the section that followed it was uh, is so full of, of head scratchers that I didn't want to rush through it. So uh, last week, um, Friday, we read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And the main point was that we can serve God and bring him glory in the way that we speak of and represent the Christian life. Uh, this is especially true when we demonstrate our attitude before those who don't know Jesus, and even more when we demonstrate uh, our attitude as we are suffering persecution on account of our faith. And how is such a thing possible? This was verse, this was verse 18. Uh, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. So not merely as an example, it doesn't say he, he suffered in order to show yourself, show you how to bring yourself to God or, or how to make yourself worthy to him or something like that, but to bring you to God. So that brings us up to speed. In the section that follows, Peter brings up a whole bunch of things that sort of seem unrelated to each other. He talks about Jesus making a proclamation to imprison spirits. He brings up Noah. He compares it to baptism. Uh, there's a, this bit about a pledge of a clear conscience. And then he wraps it up with talk of, of resurrection and ascension. And all this in just four verses. So I'm going to read it, and then we're going to break it down a little. I'm going to also back up and reread verse 18 sort of as a bridge between these two sections. So 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 18. For in Christ... For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, uh, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Uh, also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is God's word. Uh, so first, as to the question of why Peter brings up so many different things right in a row, you can sort of notice that it reads like a creedal statement. Like if I was speaking to you and and I was trying to make a point, and I said, because I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. You would recognize that I'm now reciting a creed. Um, it sort of follows that that sort of pattern. Uh, maybe that helps us to understand why he's, he's hitting a bunch of points. Uh, but there are some of these points that require a little bit more explanation. First in verse 18, he was, uh, he was put to death uh, in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Um, if you look in, in other translations, they maybe handle that differently. Some say put to death in the body, made alive in the Spirit. Um, but you can also, you can say by the put to death by the flesh, raised to life by the Spirit, like we have, have here or mix them. But some have, have sort of interpreted this to support uh, their previously held conclusions about what Jesus, uh, Jesus' death and resurrection meant. Um, some have, have interpreted it to mean that Jesus experienced a physical death, but only a spiritual resurrection, like his body went into the grave and stayed there, and his soul rose. And I'll say this, it's, it's grammatically possible for it to say that, but it's not, it's not theologically possible, because you would have to ignore everything else the Bible has to say about Jesus' resurrection. Just... Look at the evidences that Jesus gave to his disciples. He wasn't just a spirit or just a ghost. He had a physical body. He ate. He had scars. He was with them. They touched him. Read 1 Corinthians 15 and see what Paul has to say about the resurrected body. Jesus was made alive as a spiritual body. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, what we know is that it means something 
different than our current bodies and yet the same in some ways uh, with continuity. And I'll say this, let's just leave it there. We don't need to have every question answered right now. For now, we wait in hopeful expectation of, of the day that all will be revealed. Next verse, what did Jesus do in his resurrection, resurrected body? Verses 19 and 20, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. Okay, after Jesus rose, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Uh, it's worth first mentioning that the word here that's translated as proclaimed is a completely different word than what we is used elsewhere that means proclaimed the gospel. This is not Jesus announcing good news to imprisoned spirits, as if as if the spirits in prison could be evangelized and saved from their sin. This is Jesus proclaiming his victory. It's good news to us, not, not to them. Uh, there's really only one other passage that talks about Jesus' descent into hell, and that's Colossians 2.15. And there we get a better sense of what this proclamation actually was. It says he made a public spectacle of them. This isn't evangelism. This is an announcement that the war is over. Jesus won. So then the other question is, who are these spirits? Peter identifies them as those who were dis disobedient uh, long ago, those who, who disobeyed. Um, people will argue about whether it's referring to lost souls uh, like sinners in hell or maybe it's, it's only uh, demons, fallen angels. I think it probably means both, but the point is that those who opposed Jesus heard the news that Jesus won. And Peter tells us this not to confuse us, but as an encouragement. So let's and let's keep it in context. The encouragement is that even if believers experience suffering, we have certainty that Jesus' saving work was completed. It was already announced even to those in hell. Then Peter makes a connection to Noah, and the connection is in the hostile audience. Uh, that this was proclaimed to those who didn't want to hear it, to those who didn't consider it good news. Noah preached for 120 years while he was building the ark, and when the flood came, how many were saved? Eight. He still had that small congregation of just his family. No one else listened. So then Peter compares the water of the flood to the water of Baptism. This is verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the remo removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Important question. Is baptism something God does for us or something we do for God? Well, what does the passage say? Baptism that now saves you. If it saves you, it's not something you do. This is God's action. And that pledge of, of a good conscience uh, or, or a clear conscience, it might push you in the other direction as if, as if baptism is my promise to God to keep my conscience clear. But the word pledge here has more of a sense of like a claim ticket. I can claim, make a claim to God that my conscience is clear. How is that possible? How can I do that? Because I'm a sinner. Well, it's because... I'm baptized. My baptism is my claim ticket that I'm innocent before God. My conscience is clear because I know that there's nothing left for me to do. There's nothing I need to do because in baptism, I have the gift of Jesus. I can stand before God without fear. I can claim my inheritance. Salvation is mine by right. And why? Because of this last, uh, as explained in this last verse and a half, uh, 21 and 22, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. No one can say anything different. No angels, no demons, no spiritual powers can take my claim away from me because they are all in submission to Jesus, and they know it. Jesus told them so, and we know it because he told us. So, this is all meant to be a comfort for us. I know that's, I know that's a lot, but here's, here's how we tie it all together. This is what it means for us. What do we have to fear? What's, what's there left for you to fear today? Temptation? Guilt? Sin? Death? Nope. All of that is in submission to Jesus. So let me just add this, this one thing. If you're not baptized, 
Um, I want to say two things about that. One, it's not lack of baptism that separates a person eternally from God. It's unbelief. Unbelief may lead a person not to get baptized. Um, but here's the other thing. If, if you're hearing this good news of Jesus and you believe it, if this is in line with your confession of faith, you are saved. But also, if you believe this but you're not baptized and your kids aren't baptized, guess what? It's free. Jesus wants you to have this assurance, this claim ticket, so that you can have absolute confidence before God. So let's just get it done. Baptism guarantees your connection to Jesus. There are things in this life, voices in this world, sin in our own hearts that preach a different message than this, that preach lies about what suffering means, that it means God's not on your side, that means he's disgusted with your sin, he's angry with you for the ways you fail to live up to his expectations. Those voices are wrong because Jesus did it all for you. And, and by his death and resurrection, he gives you a clear conscience before God as a gift. And he seals it with baptism. This is good news. Keep this in the back of your mind today, maybe even the front of your mind today, uh, that we don't know what life has in store for us, but the end is absolutely certain because you are in Jesus. In his name, amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.